I drank three bottles? <laughs> yeah, that's why. I want you to That's my question. How much did you drink? Your money in that stuff. to be here with Mr. Aaron Miller, winemaker at Plum Track, and uh, we thought we'd just use this time on a Friday afternoon to enjoy the new releases and future releases from Plum Track. Aaron, how you doing? I'm doing well, Sandra. <laughs> thanks, thanks everybody for tuning in to see us uh, and to taste these wines with us. Uh, we're excited about these wines and uh, we miss having everybody here. Uh, it's getting a little bit lonely here, uh, being on property, making these wines and having no one here to enjoy the wines with us. So uh, we'll do what we can to, uh, to connect with you guys. So thanks for joining in. Well, I'm enjoying this one, Aaron. <laughs> is this the only white wine you make? Reserve Chardonnay? <clears throat> this is the only white wine we make. So we make the Funk Jack Reserve Chardonnay, which is a 2018 vintage. Why do you call it reserve, Aaron? It's just that good. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> no, this is the only Chardonnay that we make, and it's the reserve Chardonnay. Uh, but at one time, we actually made several Chardonnays. We made a lot of wines, and including a Sangiovese and a Petit Syrah and Syrah, and we had a, a lot of different varietals, a few different Chardonnays, and um, our brilliant general manager. I'm not saying that because he's right here. He's, but he's uh, brilliant. And he is right here. And our boss. <laughs> Hi, John. Hey. <laughs> he, there he is. John uh, decided to focus on the estate, the Public Jack Cabernet Sauvignon and Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon, and also to bring down the other varietals to, uh, to just the Chardonnay, one Chardonnay, and a Merlot, and later we re reintroduced the Syrah. Uh, but because we picked our favorite Chardonnay, uh, we call it the Reserve Chardonnay. Aaron, when I'm out in the field calling on restaurants, talking to customers, I get the most confused looks about this wine. It says Plump Reserve Chardonnay Napa. But it is not what people expect from a Napa Valley Reserve Chardonnay. Why is your Chardonnay different? Uh, we take a different approach to making yeah. the Chardonnay. Uh, I take the same approach with the Chardonnay as with the rest of our lineup here. We want to showcase the, the varietal and the vineyard. And so I make the Chardonnay with a lot less oak than we typically see in some Napa Valley wines. It's only about 30-35% oak fermented in age. The rest is uh, made in stainless steel. Uh, and so the, the stainless steel really helps to allow the fruit to really come through. So you still get really nice fresh fruit character. Uh, and you can really recognize the Chardonnay varietal and also the two different vineyards that we're sourcing the fruit from, one in St. Helena and one down in Carneros. The oak is just a little bit of a, a supporting character, just adds a little more uh, nuance, more complexity to the wine, uh, gives it a little bit of sweetness on the nose and also some palate weight. Uh, but it's just really to support the wine and frame the fruit. And then we also don't do any malolactic fermentation, so nice bright acid really lively and that helps to accentuate the fruit on the palate as well so all of that really comes through in the wine do we do you grow it here in oakville no we don't <laughs> uh, so we get some chardonnay from saint helena on zin from Belain, and also down in carneros uh, the south end of napa valley and these are two completely different uh, growing regions within the valley much different temperatures and climates so down in Carneros, you can be 10 or 15 degrees cooler than St. Helena, 
and the fruit expression is different because of that. So in Carneros, we get more of the, uh, the fresh fruits, pear, apple, you know, boss pear, nice skin, the pear skin flavors, uh, nice acid, just really beautiful acid. And uh, in St. Helena, we have more uh, tropical fruits, more melon, some banana sometimes, and also a lot of creaminess to the palate, so a lot of richness. There's no secret how I feel about this one. <laughs> no, what is your saying? Am I allowed to say that? Oh, yeah. Okay, rich <laughs> and bright, like a great date, y'all. Seriously. <laughs> this one has the texture of a grilled scallop. I uh, think sometimes about, they call it hogfish in some places, black cod in another, but you know that creaminess that's not cloying? You won't find any popcorn butter in this one. I'm telling you. Try yeah. this. It'll be very, well, happy. I've never heard of hogfish. Never? Anywhere, no. <laughs> what is hogfish? It's like black cod. black cod? Uh-huh. Yeah, I can't remember where I was. Yeah? Hey, is anyone is anyone out there? Anyone anyone with us? We have fans from... Uh, was it Minneapolis, Minnesota? Was it Minneapolis where we... I think maybe I had a hogfish there once. No, I don't South right Florida now. says hello. Yep, hey, Arizona, Wisconsin, Texas, it's all right. Ohio. Where's everybody else from? Yeah, we've got quite a few people just getting tuned in. So they've got Plump Jack Chardonnay. They're drinking the 13 Estate. They've got an old Merlot. Nice. Awesome. Somebody wants to know uh, what would pair well with the Plump Jack Chardonnay. Well, you know, funny that you said I was just in South Florida and I happened to have lunch at Joe's Stone Crab. I'm telling you, that was one of the most magical pairings I've, ever, I've had in a yeah. long time. And that was just before the whole world shut down. But stone crabs, plum jack chardonnay, winning combination. It's, it's pretty versatile. You can do a lot with it. Um, I have had it with like a, a lobster salad with uh, grapefruit and avocado and lobster. Mm. Uh, works really well with that. It's a pretty rich wine with a lot of acids, so it, it stands up to a lot. It can it can take an oily fish like a, a hogfish, uh, and uh, at the same time, it, well, it has the acid to cut through the oiliness, and it has the weight to stand up to the oiliness. So scallops work really well, um, lobster, crab, mm -hmm. but also you know you can. It's a balanced wine. If it's a balanced meal, it'll work. So you can have it with a steak if you want. You can. You know what else is good with? The front porch. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> On a warm day. Any day. Danny oh, Arnold just opened up a 2013 Plump Jack Reserve. Oh, nice. That's oh, a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. That one, uh, our first 100 point wine. So that will be, always be a special wine for us. Mm -hmm. He's like my reserve cab, right? Yep. Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. Savannah wants to say hello. She's a Napa local. What's up, Savannah? Mm. Both of you love. Oh, we love Savannah. Hey, girl. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Oh, Danielle Soreau popped uh -oh. in. Uh -oh. Say hello. <laughs> you guys remember her from last week? She makes the wine up at Cade. Hey, Danielle. I saw your show, Danielle, just about an hour ago. <laughs> hey, what's <laughs> Thanks the next for checking one? in. Aaron. Uh, so the next wine that we have is the 2016 Plum Jack Syrah. Somebody uh, earlier had a question on Instagram about this. Um, Don't mind me, I have a fly in my wine. <laughs> um, we had a, a question before the show about the Syrah. If um, they heard that maybe you weren't going to be making a 17, didn't know if it was coming back, and if so, do you have to make any changes to it? Uh, we So we're showing the 16 because we don't have a 17. Uh, if you remember, we had a lot of fires throughout the valley in, in 2017, and it really affected some wineries. Uh, we were one of those wineries that it affected, so um, our Syrah and Merlot were pretty heavily affected, and we decided not to make uh, Syrah or Merlot in 2017. And so we don't have uh, a Merlot here in this lineup either because of that. Um, but we decided to, uh, just for our integrity and for you as well, uh, so you get the best wines that we can possibly make. We were not going to make a wine those years. Uh, but we do have the 2018 in the cellar right now, and it's actually in tank. We just pulled it out of barrel this week and getting it ready for bottling. So we're bottling that in a couple of weeks. Uh, so that will be coming back soon. 
the Syrah is a really versatile grape, grape, right? They grow it in France, they grow it in California, right. grow it in Australia. Why, what, what makes our Syrah different from, from those other regions? Well, the, the place is the biggest part. I mean, even within Napa Valley, Syrah can be really different um, one site to the next. Uh, it is really, um, it, the climate has a huge effect on the way that Syrah is expressed. And I guess any varietal, but Syrah, you can really pick it up. Uh, in, in California, Napa Valley, uh, which is only runs you know, 30 miles north to south, uh, there's a huge difference in the temperature from Carneros to even up here in Oakville, which is only about 20 miles from Carneros. And, um, and so that changes the expression of Syrah. Down in Carneros, where it's a little cooler, it's more spice driven. It's more um, of that varietal, a lot of varietal character, I call it. It's got a lot of black peppercorn and white pepper and gamey, meaty notes and smoky notes. And uh, at the same time, it does have nice fruit and blueberry and just really beautiful black cherry, uh, but it's kind of dominated by some of that spice. Uh, whereas you go further north where it's warmer and you might get more of a, that warm weather uh, Syrah, which has more jammy notes, more fruit driven uh, style of Syrah. It, it, it also to me, I always get, this may not be the right term, but a woodsy character. Yeah, like forestry. Where yeah. does that come from, Aaron? That's, that's from the grape. I can tell you exactly what <laughs> compounds do you do, make that. I know. Do you do any kind of uh, special fermentations? We do so. With the, this is one of the wines that is that where you're trying to lead them? Yes. <clears throat> okay. I don't know if the, I don't know if the woodsiness comes from that. So she's she's trying to lead me toward our uh, um, whole cluster fermentation. So that's Lucy style for y'all who don't know what that means. Right. So we instead of <laughs> taking the grapes off the stems and fermenting it, which we do with a large portion of this wine, the the rest about 25 to 35 percent, depending on the vintage. Uh, we will put the whole clusters into fermenters, <clears throat> leave the stems on, and you extract some character from the stems, kind of like a green peppercorn, a green spice, uh, something that works really well in the straw and adds another dimension on the nose, gives it a little bit more uh, of a different kind of structure on the palate, a little bit of bite in the finish. And it's a really nice um, <clears throat> kind of addition to this wine. It just really makes it beautiful. Someone's raising their hand. <laughs> just a question from uh from facebook wants to know if this would be um a good wine to drink with a cigar oh yeah of course definitely i mean it, you can drink any of these with a cigar but the this has like a nice little smoky element that really makes it um it would really go well with the cigar it also has a lot of richness to the wine so um it'll coat your palate as well when you're smoking a cigar so but yeah, when we do that whole cluster fermentation, we do get to get inside the fermenters and stomp on the grapes, Lucy style. So that's a lot of fun. <laughs> oh yeah, another question. Um, does Plum Jack use a bottling service? And if so, has COVID-19 impacted your schedules? We oh, do a use a bottling service. And so far it has not impacted our schedules. We were concerned that we wouldn't be able to get uh, you know, bottling supplies and that sort of thing on time, but we did. Uh, we have just been able to implement different uh, strategies and um, uh, criteria to make sure that everyone is safe on our bottling lines. Oh, Syrah's good. Were you inspired any, by anything in 13, well, Aaron? In 13? Or, well, it, was it 13? In, I think in 13. Yeah, we went to the Rhone Valley in 2013 and we visited some really amazing uh, wineries both in the Southern Rhone and the Northern Rhone and tried a lot of Syrah and got to see how they're making the wines. And so I was able to, um, yeah, I was inspired by some of that. And so I was able to uh, get some concrete fermenters so we can try some concrete. Don't tell John that I use it for the Syrah because I told him it was for the cab. <laughs> he's gone. I think <laughs> okay, it's he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's, it, it, I think it added a lot to the wine, uh, a lot of depth on the palate rounded the edges on it and brings out some of the darker fruit character um, and so that really I think added a lot to the wine. Is this a wine you think would age well? Of course yeah there's a lot of really well structured nice acid beautiful wine uh, a lot of intensity on the on the uh, nose and palate and actually I find that it, it is better with a little bit of age um, it kind of mellows out it becomes a little bit more subtle mm -hmm. after a few years in bottle. 
Okay, but yes. I'm getting a lot of cardamom, kind of the spicy characteristics. It's delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Brent Warner wants to know what your secret is to continuing growth to turn out 100 point wines, as well as what year is your favorite vintage of PJ? Well, the one in your glass. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that's the sales. The sales force says the wine that we're selling right now is my favorite vintage. No, the one in your glass. The one in your drinking. glass. So the um, as far as like turning out 100 point wines, it's not really the the goal. We're not trying to make 100 point wines year in year out. We're just trying to make the best wine that we can make. Uh, each vintage is different. We have different, you know, same fruit sources every year. We have this same estate that we're working with, but the fruit has different character just because of the vintage. Uh, whatever Mother Nature gave us that year. You know, we, we respond in the vineyard, we respond in the cellar to try to make the best wines that we can make. Uh, but, you know, we're not necessarily trying to make 100 point wines. Uh, our growth is, has been, you know, somewhat limited. We, we only have the fruit that we have here, so we haven't really been able to grow the Cabernet Sauvignon program. Um, but really, I'm just trying to use the, you know, grow, um, <clears throat> As far as me and the seller and my, my the way I'm making the wines, try to grow personally and professionally to to uh, use different techniques and always learn, uh, learn from past vintages and you know just keep paying attention to what is out there um, as far as different techniques for making wine so I can keep growing in the cellar. Um, <clears throat> my favorite vintage is really hard because I, I you know I started here in 2012 and we've made a lot of good wines since then. And two of my favorites are obviously, obviously for me, are 12 and 15, because those were the years that my kids were born. Um, and I think they might be watching. Hi, Evie. Hello. Hi, Owen. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so those are two of my favorite years. And then 13 was great, because that was our first 100 point wine. Uh, as far as quality goes, I think 2016 might be one of my favorite vintages uh, for the Cabernet Sauvignon. And then for the Chardonnay, probably 2017, I really loved. Uh, that was just a beautiful wine. So it just, there's different reasons for liking different vintages. It's hard to just pick out one vintage. Yes, this, is, this is maybe uh, for Sandra. Um, Chris Bryce said that the Syrah is hard to find on the East Coast. What would you suggest? Well, I agree. Part of it is because Aaron refused to make it in 2017. I, I say it in jest, but... Uh, the fact of the matter is, we won't we won't put our name on it if it's not worthy of you. Um, so, 17, we had the fires. The two vineyards that the Syrah comes from were on fire. And uh, the wines, unfortunately, the berries suffered too much smoke taint to make it. However, uh, the 18 will be released in July. So, you should be able to find it there in your restaurants on the East Coast uh, when they open. When they open. Yeah, <laughs> when they open. <laughs> um, Alicia Rowe loves your wines. Um, she purchased a Plump Jack cab um, in 2014. Not sure which one, but um, she's planning to open it for her daughter's 21st in four years. And she wants to know if that might be too late to open it. No, that won't be too late. It'll be perfect. Uh, that 2014 in four years would be a 10-year-old wine. That'd be perfect. Yeah, that'd be perfect. I, it, it's, it all depends on personal preference for me when you open a bottle of wine. Obviously there's going to be a peak and it's going to start to decline at some point. Uh, but some people like wines that are fruitier and some people like wines that have a little bit more age on it, more of the oak coming through or, and after a number of years, maybe 10, 12, 15 years, depending on the wine, you'll start getting more, uh, more what we call tertiary character, like cigar and cedar and tobacco and uh, drier fruit character versus a fresher fruit character. Um, I personally like the fresh fruit, and so I drink them a little bit earlier, probably in the eight to 15 range, um, our wines. Uh, it just depends on your own personal preference. And I think 10 years for 2014, I think it'll be, it'll be really good. Yeah, I think our wines at 10 years are delicious. Yeah, it's perfect. It really is a sweet spot. <clears throat> Well, speaking of Cabernet, shall we? I think we should, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> have a little more of the Syrah first. That's so delicious. Yeah. Well, what would you pair with that? I mean, I've had it. Oh, oh I gotta tell so the story. Much. I had there was a chef in Louisiana, and I said, 
what would you pair this Syrah with? He said, girl, ducking and dewy gumbo. I think that sounds pretty good. That does sound pretty good. <laughs> Chef Pat, thank you for your suggestion. We have a couple people pairing the Syrah with ribs, yeah. as well as a T-bone tonight. Ooh, that was going to be a good night. Yeah, I I open the Syrah a lot when I, so my, my wife bought me a Texas offset smoker for my birthday a couple years ago. And so I use it as often as I can. And that smoke with the Syrah is awesome. Oh, so yeah. It's, yeah, the ribs would be great. Totally. T-bone, great. Burgers, whatever, anything. Well, I think there's a better pairing for a burger, Aaron. Yeah, well, I know you. She likes what about <laughs> a pairing for the PJ Chardonnay? Oh, don't. We talked about a few things, yeah. like the uh, scallops work really nice, lobster, um, Black cod, fish. black cod, that creaminess, um, I, lobster mac and cheese. Yeah. The front porch. Cauliflower Sorry. mac and cheese. Cauliflower mac and cheese. Be perfect. Yeah. Fried chicken. <laughs> really good with fried chicken. Yeah. yeah. That Chardonnay is good. It's pretty friendly, honestly. Uh, yeah, it's pretty friendly. And so now we have the 2017 Plum Jack Estate Cabernet Sauvignon. This was from uh, it's a couple years ago, and this was, again, that vintage where we worked so hard to make these wines because of all the fires that we had around here. Uh, and I think that we were fortunate to be able to make a wine of this quality. Uh, we, we worked hard to do it, uh, but it's just a beautiful wine. It comes from here, from this estate here. Uh, and this is a unique place, I think, to grow grapes and to make these wines. Uh, the reason that these wines are so special is because of the property that we have here, both the Plunk Jack Estate and Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, <clears throat> this property, you can't see probably from here, maybe you can see the mountains in the background on the, on the, on the screen, uh, but on the, in the mountains on, on the side of the valley, the Baca Mountains, you know, years and years and years ago, millennia ago, uh, we had huge landslides that brought a lot of uh, rock and dirt from the mountainside onto the valley floor and we are, and that fans out when it hits the valley floor and that's called an alluvial fan. And we are kind of at the edge of that alluvial fan, which is what makes this spot just beautiful and unique because we have so much soil diversity that we get a lot of different expressions of Cabernet Sauvignon throughout our vineyard site. And I have a lot of different tools to play with to make the estate cab and the reserve cab because they have different characters uh, for each block. So I can blend and make these wines different and unique and special. Uh, on the, the far east side of the estate, closer to the mountains, we have more rock. And as you move to the west, we get uh, diminishing uh, rock and, and gravel. So you get a little bit more loam, silt, and then finally clay. And last week, Danielle mentioned that uh, that one of her Sauvignon Blancs, the estate Sauvignon Blanc, comes from this property. And that is in the heavier soils on the west side of the property. Uh, and it makes beautiful Sauvignon Blanc. And so uh, the, the estate cab here is a blend of the entire estate. So the rocky soils, the loamy soils, uh, and everything in between. And I think that that gives this wine just a, a lot of uh, complexity. It makes it a very dynamic wine because you have darker fruit flavors and concentration and richness and uh, depth on the east side. And then you move to the west and you get redder fruits and raspberries and cherries and some floral notes, sometimes some lavender. Mm -hmm. um, and then also some sage and mint, really nice fresh character. And the palate has more acid and it's more elegant and more, uh, uh, just like more, it's a beautiful style of wine. And so this wine here that we're having now is blended from the entire estate. How do you get a texture? I think what stands out to me for Plum Jack is always this velvet rich texture without being heavy or plain it's it's uh it's just uh, luxurious that's my secret <laughs> i can't just tell you how i do this sandra uh there's i think there's a lot that goes into that part of it is just the site it's oakville and oakville is really known for having that silky beautiful sweet tannin uh which is 
glides across your tongue and just coats your whole palate. Uh, there's no edges to it. It's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it comes from the way that we're extracting in the, in the fermenter, the way we do our pump overs, um, you know, trying not to over extract, and making sure we get enough uh, of the tannin uh, so that we do have good structure. And then uh, also barrels make an impact as well. Mm -hmm. You know, our barrel selection is we make sure we have barrels that uh, complement the wine, that add the right kind of structure, that aren't gritty and chalky on the palate, mm -hmm. but are tight and fine um, as far as the tannin goes, and just adds texture, but not like a grittiness. You're one of the first winemakers who ever talked to me about the skins on the grape change right before you harvest think that has a big impact uh, yeah I think so so when I'm when I'm out there picking or looking to pick and making decisions to pick uh, I am tasting the grapes and feeling the texture of the skins and if the grapes are not quite ready yet I think the skins are a little thicker mm. and if they're a little thicker then they won't give as much like more of the tannin and color and other uh, compounds that are in the skin, so we're kind of locked up. And if you wait just up to the right time, so the skins thin out a little bit, then you can get that stuff out. Amazing. Yeah. So you are you are literally <clears throat> walking these rows, looking for the right texture. Yeah, right flavors, right textures, the right tannin. Yes, Facebook. Oh. Hello, Facebook. Um, someone was curious about where you're sitting. Is this a place that people coming to visit would sit or? It is, yes. So we have uh, this area here and another one up here. This is my outdoor office. Because uh, my indoor office is like in a cave with no windows. <laughs> it's true actually. Yeah. And so uh, this is my outdoor office and it's also where people can come and taste uh, when we are open to the public again. Uh, you can definitely call the tasting room and book a hilltop tasting. We're on top of a little knoll, a little rock hill uh, in the back of the winery overlooking one of our vineyards. Mm. Good. What would you put the cab with? For food? Yeah. Uh, uh, filet. I think it goes good with a filet. I mean, I like the, the plum jack cab with a filet and I like the cave with uh, like a T-bone or something like that. So. I wouldn't uh, throw or, either one of them off the table, just FYI. Yeah. <laughs> great wines. Great wines. So, it, but I, I like I like this with uh, with steak or with anything. Yeah, I'll, I'll have it with a hearty pasta. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the most surprising pairings I ever had with this wine and uh, was blackened tuna. It was perfect. Perfect pairing. Spice really came through. And I had it with a spicy red snapper once, and that didn't work. <laughs> no, I remember that dinner. Yeah. <laughs> it was terrible. So don't, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so you um, you opened this cab, and it looks like that might be a screw cap enclosure. Yes. Um, so Sabina from the Vine in Toronto um, wants to Hi, know. Sabina. Yeah, she wants to know if you could speak to the decision to bottle the reserve um, cab under cork and versus screw cap or both. Well, we do both. So the, the estate cab is mostly bottled under cork, but we do uh, a few hundred cases under screw cap. The reserve is half cork, half screw cap. Uh, we just happen to have a cork here today. Uh, and we started doing it because we... we we weren't seeing a lot of smoke tainted or uh, cork tainted wines necessarily, uh, but one of our businesses was when our uh, restaurant in San Francisco was seeing a lot of smoke tainted wines. And so um, our ownership decided that maybe we should not accept a high rate of failure uh, from, you know, from the, just a closure. Uh, at that time, this was way back in the year 2000, and with our 1997 vintage, uh, when we bottled our first wines under screw cap and at that time it was estimated that six seven eight percent of all wines finished with cork were cork tainted and our owner thought that was just a ridiculous and unacceptable risk to take as a business like no business would uh, take that kind of risk or just accept that kind of uh, product failure that's one in 12 bottles <clears throat> right one per case 
and so and it, and it's definitely gotten better. Uh, now we're looking at two, three, or four uh, percent uh, for um, smoke. I keep saying smoke tank. Uh, it's on the, on the on the mind. The cork tank. Uh, and so um, we decided to use the screw caps because we thought that we should try to avoid that kind of failure. And we've had a lot of success with it. Uh, we've done a lot of tastings and mm -hmm. seeing that the wines that are bottled under screw cap are fresher, been fresher longer, they age well. They, I, I think they age better when you get to a 15 year old bottle of wine. Uh, it still has fresh fruit, it's still beautiful on the nose and has a great texture on the palate. Whereas the cork, the cork version might be a little more um, cigar, yeah. cedar, tobacco. I think yeah. about the screw cap won't be corked. I mean, yeah. could it be that simple? And, and you won't talk about it, but our winemakers, Aaron Miller works three years to make this wine. One year in the vineyard, two years in the cellar, and then we package it and put a piece of tree bark in there. And eight, at back then, 8% of the time, it was ruined from that moment. That's that's unacceptable to any, to any if, if Tide detergent ruined your clothes, you know, one out of every 12 times because of the packaging, you, you Consider probably, different packaging. Probably wouldn't use it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all we were trying to do, and this was 90, 1997, reserve cab. People said we were crazy. We were going to go out of business. It was the yeah. dumbest thing we'd ever done besides our dumb name. <laughs> well, maybe they were right about crazy. But we thought, how can we be um, innovative? How can we think of a, a different idea? Um, something that would ensure the wine you drink is the wine he intended you to drink. I think that was scary and exciting and the right choice. And we weren't sure either. We didn't know how they would age. That's why we did half. So in any of our reserve wines that you buy in a six pack or a two pack, you'll get one cork and one screw cap so that you can participate with us in this grand experiment. Yes, so does Instagram. this mean that you can store a screw top bottle vertically yes of course yes you can uh, you don't have to lay it down yeah the, the reason to lay down a, a cork is to keep the cork moist so it doesn't dry up and get small and let tons of oxygen into your bottle right. yes facebook so <laughs> Chad Hine um, said, obviously the estate ABAs are different with Cade, Plum Jack, and Odette, Howell Mountain, Oak Phil, Stag's Leap. But what else is noticeably or notably different beyond that? Do winemakers have different styles? Design-wise, the wineries have different feels. Plum Jack, more rustic. Cade and Odette, more modern sleek. Does that carry over into the winemaking technique or your philosophy at all? Are you more rustic here? <clears throat> Sounds like Chad's been here a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Thanks. you're more rustic. Our, our winery? No, you. Oh, me. Yeah. I'm going to say our, definitely our winery is. Yes. Yeah. No, the, the wineries do have different feels. Uh, and definitely the winemakers uh, have an impact. Yeah, you know, we're, we're not in a vacuum. So we all have an impact. We all have different palettes. We have different ways of, of um, you know, going about and um, you know, making our decisions for picking. Uh, and our grapes are very different. So Plum Jack's grapes here on the estate uh, have just a really nice level of tannin. I try to extract quite a bit of it. Whereas Danielle up on Howe Mountain, uh, those grapes have so much tannin, so much structure that she's gonna conduct her fermentations much differently than I am because she doesn't wanna get all of that out. Uh, she's only gonna get out you know, a certain percentage, whatever that percentage might be of the tannin because if she extracted it the, the way that I extract ours here, the wine would be undrinkable for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do have different techniques and different approaches to making the wine. And then on top of that, of course, we just have different palettes. We have had different experiences in the past. We've learned from different winemakers. Uh, we've worked for different wineries. And so our techniques aren't all exactly the same. Um, we use different yeast strains. We use different barrels. Uh, you know, and a lot of that has to do with just our experiences in the past and then also our own personal preferences. And our own personal preferences will uh, evolve. Uh, I, I don't feel like I'm the same winemaker I was eight years ago when I started here. I, I think that uh, 
my palate has evolved and um, I think that my my strategies have changed as well. So. And you know your place better. Yeah, and I know my vineyards better. I know my winery itself better. Uh, and so, you know, and I'm still learning, I'm still learning about me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Amelia 99 FSU wants to cheers you guys. Oh, cheers, cheers. Amelia. Go Tigers. <laughs> You knew that was she coming. FSU, I, I know. Not LSU. I know. Okay. <laughs> Aaron, what? Go uh, Aggies. Go Aggies. Go, go Aggies. Yeah. Those are the. the UC, UC Davis. Davis Aggies. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Instagram. Boston K O three wants to know what should I drink tonight? Twenty ten PJ or twenty ten Reserve? Too soon on the Reserve? Uh, I don't think it's too soon. Ask but... him who he's with. Is he a busy or she. <laughs> I don't know who KO is. All right, good point. But uh, I, I, I don't think it's too soon on the reserve, but uh, if you have both, then you might want to just do How about both? Plunk jack or do both, I guess. Both. Yeah. Uh, but the, but they're the with their wife. But the vintage is, is amazing. <laughs> then you'll probably need both. Yeah. <laughs> to celebrate. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this is delicious, Aaron. Thank you. Uh, back to your Aggies shout out. Um, another individual earlier wanted to know your educational background. Uh, so I went to UC Davis uh, twice. I oh wait, to... we have to we have to tie that into how on earth you got into this business. Did you start by wanting to be a winemaker? No, no, of course not. I um, I think my story is pretty similar to a lot of people that I've met in uh, in Napa Valley winemakers. Uh, in that I was I wanted to go to medical school. Yeah, I went to UC Davis. I'm from Sacramento, and I, I wanted to go to UC Davis to uh, study, you know, do all the prerequisites for medical school, study pre-med. And uh, what was it? after neurobiology, physiology, and behavior. Neurobiology. <laughs> physiology. And physiology, I'm and just behavior. saying. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I, I, I got my degree in neurobiology, physiology, and behavior, but after my second year, I did internships at some emergency rooms uh, in Sacramento and realized that it, I didn't want to go to medical school. Like, this was not my thing, not for me. And uh, there were a few different experiences that I had in there that really turned me off to the whole, um, the whole idea, the whole concept. Can we pause there and say, shout out to all those people who could uh, oh, yeah. hang out in the emergency rooms because you guys are our heroes right now. Yeah. You are our heroes. Just to pre just to pause for that. No, I totally agree. Yeah. And, yeah. And, I, and I, and I, and I wish I could have done it, but it wasn't in my DNA. So, yeah. um, and so I spent the next couple of years looking for other options, what I, what I could do. I looked at different, um, fields in medicine and I looked at all kinds of different stuff. Uh, and so I I guess what ended up happening was my senior year, I wanted to move closer to campus with my roommates. We all wanted to move closer to campus, and I just happened to move in across the street from somebody that was uh, working at another winery here in Napa Valley, and she was in the winemaking program, and she taught me a lot about wine and showed me, introduced me to the winemaking program and really piqued my interest, and uh, that was my senior year. And she gave me my first job out of college. Uh, I worked in the lab with her, uh, for her, uh, for a harvest in 2000. 2000. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> and so that was really where I got started. I, I learned uh, a lot about myself. I learned that I really liked hands-on work. Um, <clears throat> I liked to get dirty. I didn't. It was and there was a lot of that. There was also a lot of the intellectual stuff. So I had this nice. Um, kind of duality where I got to work with my hands a lot but also do uh, a lot of lab work and a lot of thinking and I was really able to see what the winemaker and assistant winemaker were doing and the enologist uh, in that they were doing a lot of um, uh, a lot of experimentation and a lot of thinking and uh, it was a very uh, kind of a cognitive ex uh, exercise uh, and so was that your aha moment <clears throat> yeah when I was like wow this is like super cognitive and at the same time very labor intensive and uh, it, it really grabbed onto me and from there I went down to San Luis Obispo did another internship 
and then went back to UC Davis to, to learn how to make wine, the Viticulture and Enology program. And I feel like more people should know that there's wine-making programs out there. It's amazing. So. If we can learn to be a wine... Well, I could. <clears throat> yeah, you could. <laughs> When I, first, I remember when I first started, when I first started the winemaking program at Davis, I was so intimidated because I was relatively new to wine. Um, I, I grabbed onto the experience and like how it spoke to me. I didn't really know wine that well yet. And so I was learning about wine. And I was learning with all these people that had, mo had more experience and uh, had more history with wine. And I was pretty convinced that I would never be able to have the palate that they had, you know. And well, that was wrong. Well, yeah, but I was uncertain. I thought you know, maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe you're born with it. Yeah. Maybe you're not. And I, and I, and maybe some people are born with it. But I had to learn it, and I had to do a lot of focus tastings, and uh, had a lot of exposure uh, to to build a vocabulary for wine and to understand what I was tasting and, and smelling. Uh, and it took time, but you can learn it. What proves you can do? You really can do anything you set your mind to. That's what I say. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I would cheers you, but I have Anybody to stay six feet away. <laughs> um, Nils and Gail Venke just joined Nils. the chat from Hello, Oklahoma. Nils. Oh, hi, Nils. Hey, Gail. Nils. So, uh, uh, Nils Venge was the first winemaker for Plum Jack Winery. So, cheers, Nils. Oh, Instagram. Mark Green wants to know, when is the best time to come visit the vineyard for a tasting? Would it be harvest, possibly? Depends on what you're looking for, what kind of experience you're looking for. Harvest is a lot of fun. It's exciting. There's a lot going on. Uh, the smells of harvest, uh, the energy, like you can feel it in the air. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible. There's a lot of people here, so it's busy. Uh, a lot of traffic on the roads, a lot of traffic in the, in the tasting rooms. Uh, and so uh, you don't get as intimate an experience, but it's incredible because of the energy. Uh, I like it here in February, March, when it's a little slower. It's beautiful. The weather. It's, the weather, weather can be like this. Uh, and just a few weeks ago, we hadn't uh, worked the vineyards yet, and so we just had a lot of beautiful green grass, mustard, yellow mustard growing everywhere. Uh, on nice days, beautiful blue skies, and it's just uh, beautiful scenery. Um, all the hills are still green, and it's just incredible. And uh, and like I said, a little quieter, so you can get a little bit more one-on-one -on -one attention. So I think that's a nice time to come yeah. to. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Aaron, I mean, I've been waiting long enough, I think, for the next ones. <laughs> oh, you know what? I had a question. I promised Patrick in Hawaii that I would ask, uh, he was asking about the yeast that you use in Reserve Shard. I use a few different yeast strains, and one of them is a really basic strain that no one really uses anymore, the Montrachet strain. And, uh, and I use that in, in a lot of the stainless steel part. And then uh, in the barrels, I use a few different strains, um, like an EC1118, uh, we use a handful. Strains. Anything wild or no? No, I used to do native fermentations on some of the uh, some of the lots, and uh, after doing a lot of trials and tastings, didn't really see that it was uh, really adding a lot to the wine. So. Can we now please drink the reserve cab, Aaron? Yes. <laughs> this is a 2016 vintage. I'm not sure if any of you out there. Have the 2016 Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> now. So really, what's the difference between the two? I know you talked a little bit about our four soil types, but um, how do you decide what, what becomes reserve and what's a state? And why Ooh, is it, does juicy. it taste so good? Yeah, that's good. I haven't had it for a while. That's like super delicious. Uh, so there are a few differences. The biggest difference is where the grapes are grown on the estate. So this is from the east side of the estate, uh, closest to the Baca Mountains. 
and that's our rockiest soils. So you, we tend to get uh, grapes that give us wines that have a lot more dark fruit, more blackberry and some blueberry, uh, a little bit of cassis, um, a lot of concentration on the palate, really rich and broad and long, and, and uh, much more tannin, but still really silky tannin. It's kind of chalky. <clears throat> yeah, a little bit yeah. of a, a little bit more grip on it. And then there's a lot of fruit in the palate too. I'm getting a lot of right now, a lot of blueberry and blackberry. Uh, so aside from the vineyard source, the site on the estate, uh, we also do 100% new oak in this wine. <clears throat> Whereas the estate Cabernet Sauvignon, the last wine, we do about 75 to 80%. And this wine is 100% new oak. And I use my favorite coopers in this wine, so it's a barrel selection also. Are you allowed to say who they are? Sure. Uh, we use uh, primarily for these this wine. I use Darnage, Juice, Sauvignon, and Terran, so, uh, which worked really well with this wine. Um, Aaron Courtney wants to make sure that you save her a glass of that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Courtney. It's Courtney, sold out, Courtney. Courtney is our assistant winemaker. <laughs> she went home early to watch. She didn't want to be a part of the show. Really? Yeah. But she's she's so great. Yeah. I know. Courtney is the one who does a lot of the Syrah punch downs. So when Aaron does those whole cluster ferments, he puts a barrel on its side, throws the clusters in there, and then Courtney, right after there, uh, jumps in. Jumps in. Stomps it down. Yep. See? <laughs> Let's see what? Oh, yeah, it's dangerous. Yep. Yep. It's dangerous here if you come to taste. It is beautiful. Would you like a hat? No, I'm good. <laughs> We have a couple of people asking, what are some of your other favorite Napa cabs? Uh, Kate and Odette. Yeah, good, yeah, yep, yeah. yep. Good question. <laughs> oh, you, you guys mentioned earlier, we had a question earlier about the architecture of the three wineries, and I think it's interesting that our architect, Juan Carlos, uh, designed Kate to reflect terroir. So Kate is how mountain tends to be a bit bigger, more structured, bigger tannins. So that winery is straight lines, and concrete, glass, and steel. Whereas uh, Odette on the Stag's Leap District, he felt, we all feel, it was a bit more feminine than Cade, uh, but Beyonce feminine, right? Bold and spicy. Uh, so he designed a winery to reflect that, so that it is round and sits right in the uh, in the mountain range, uh, but I, I heard he was inspired by a woman's corset. And then Aaron here at Plump Jack, well, his winery was designed in the late 1800s by some Italians. Also <laughs> named Juan Carlos. Really? No. <laughs> well, where did the name Plump Jack come from, Aaron? I thought we were talking about the winery. <laughs> well, you distracted uh, me. <laughs> Uh, Plump Jack came from Shakespeare. You probably tell the story better than I do. You think? Yeah. Well, you're the a, you're a, you're a storyteller. I'm the well, winemaker. You make it, I sell it. Yeah. Yeah. So Plump Jack was uh, inspired by a character in Henry IV, John Falstaff. And I always say, I picture him at the end of a table with an overflowing glass of wine, um, <clears throat> telling jokes and ribbing the queen. So we, we wanted to honor John Falstaff by naming our winery after him. <laughs> And, and the story I heard goes that Gavin, when he started the wine shop in San Francisco, they were trying to come up with a name that, that um, kind of represented that convivial feel. And that he was sitting in uh, his family friend's office, Gordon Getty, and there was a bust of this character in the, in the office because Gordon had written an opera in the 80s uh, to, I don't know, because he was inspired by John Falstaff. So we wanted to take that somewhat irreverent, convivial attitude up to Napa Valley when we started this winery, and then again, Plump Jack became the name. Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wine is about uh, just community and fun, and uh, there, there should be no haughtiness about it. You know, yeah. just about a good time. And so, when you come to Plum Jack or NK and Odette, you can see that here. Yeah. You know, it's just relaxed and fun and just a beautiful scene with great people um, and really nice wines. Yeah. You can, yeah. you can take your wine and your vineyards and your farming really seriously without taking yourself so seriously. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, for sure. 
This is delicious. <laughs> I'm serious about this, though. No, this is awesome. <laughs> anybody else wow. have 16? Y'all, anybody reserve? have 16 reserve or anybody enjoying reserve cab from Plump Jack? There are a few people. Um, somebody wants to know. Uh, they've had all three, but which do you think is the best, the K Dodette or the Plum Jack Reserve? I like the Plum Jack. I can't answer. <laughs> I like the Plum Jack. Yes. <clears throat> but I make it, so I have a bias, <laughs> of course. I, I, I love all the wines for different reasons, and they have different character because of where the grapes are grown and also right. because we're three different winemakers and different facilities. But uh, they're all amazing wines. I love them all. Uh, some days I like one better than the other. And another day I might like another the best, yep. but uh, it has to do with either the way it's showing that day or my mood that day or what I'm eating or what I had for breakfast or That's if right. I had a medium roast coffee or a, a dark roast coffee, I That's don't know. Right. That's right. Uh, but um, but obviously like my heart is always with the Plump Jack because that's my it's your wine. baby. Yeah, I spend a lot of time making these wines and, uh, and so they, they have a lot of meaning to me. Yeah, I think what's really neat about what we do here, I say all the time, our objective is to lift this place to its highest potential. So by Aaron going out and feeling the texture of the skins, or Danielle's 50 passes on an 80-acre vineyard, Jeff's 28 passes down at 32, the, the goal is to make the best wine that this land can produce. And we are so fortunate that our owners are generous enough to allow us to do these crazy things um, to, to coax the best out of this land. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, York, Lydia, go ahead. Instagram, Instagram. Instagram's Instagram. taking the lead here. Uh, New York Ann is drinking this wine All right, along New York with Ann. you. And uh, Brent wants to send you guys a cheers from Montreal. Wow. Thanks, Brent. That's fantastic. Lydia Chase is also enjoying the 16 Reserve. And um, Aaron Berrios wants to know if it's a bit young or if it can be drank right now. Uh, it can be drank right now. It's showing really well. It's really silky smooth tannins. It's not, uh, it's not edgy and, and too big right now. It's just showing really well. A lot of fruit coming through. Uh, it's not at all closed up and tight. It's showing really well. Yeah. Uh, but you can also hold on to this wine for years, 20, 25, 30 years. It's kind of showing off right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's really demanding your attention. And the tannins are not um, sticky. They're chalky. They're smooth. And it has the same texture. I think uh, so far with the four wines we've tasted, that's the common theme is texture and balance. Right. It's, it's magical, Aaron. The texture is important for me. Yeah. When I'm doing a lot of my tastings, I'm thinking a lot about texture. Uh, and I rely on uh, Courtney a lot for aromatics because her nose is so strong. And I'm thinking more about texture. And, uh, and so when we do a lot of our blendings and when I'm tasting through barrels, deciding which barrels to, uh, to keep and which, uh, which may, might not be working with our wines, um, I'm really focusing a lot on the texture and the, and the way that oak interacts with the wine and uh, <clears throat> deciding what barrels to go with from there. So it's delicious. Yeah. So it's um uh, it's um you know it's barbecue season coming up pretty soon. Yeah. And and there's this one wine that I've been waiting for for over a year. Um and I heard that you were racking it recently. This week, yeah. So <clears throat> so here we have four of our five wines. Uh, what is missing here is our Merlot. And it's been missing for a year. We didn't make it 2017, just like the Syrah, we didn't make it 2017. And so uh, we haven't had it for a while. We've been sold out of the 16 for a little while. So, um, but we did pull a, a sample. So we, we racked it, we pulled it out of barrel and it's getting ready for bottling. And we pulled the sample. So uh, I don't have it here. We have it up, let's go taste up on it. top of the hilltop and we can go up there. Okay, let's do it. I'm taking this with me. Oh yeah, okay. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay, oh, I have to go first. Six feet. Six feet, y'all. So 
this is my other outdoor office. This one's a little more spacious. Got a little more room up here. <laughs> and you can definitely come have a tasting here uh, the minute they let you out of your house. The first thing I can see, this color is amazing, Erin. I'm not even saying that to be nice. It's incredible. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so this is the 2018 Merlot. This will be bottled in two weeks. Mm. Uh, so we just pulled it out of a uh, barrel this, this week and have it in tank and it'll all kind of marry together and over the course of the next two weeks we'll just kind of all, all those barrels that were individual components will all come together and make one wine and kind of come into come into itself yeah uh, and then we'll bottle the wine and uh and i'm really excited about this wine a because we didn't have 2017 but b it's just a beautiful wine oh. Uh, we get this Merlot from the Oak Knoll region of Napa Valley, which is further south, uh, just north of the city of Napa. And it's, it's what I call the Goldilocks kind of region of Napa Valley for Merlot. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right. And it's just, uh, it gives us uh, uh, grapes that, and wines from the grapes that have this perfect character for me. It's not too hot there so you don't get jammy Merlot. It's not too cold so you don't get rustic, edgy Merlot. Uh, it's just perfect so you just get this beautiful fruit expression, uh, nice black cherry and muddled raspberries and uh, really nice structure and good weight and good color. Uh, we do this wine here, we put a little bit of Malbec into it. Malbec gives it a little bit more color, more weight, kind of more volume. Kind of well, yeah, yeah, from that, from that vineyard block. Yeah. Yeah. Do you use, what's the oak treatment here, Aaron? Uh, this wine here is about 75% new oak, 25% uh, used, and then we use some American oak as well. Mostly French oak, but about 10-11% American oak this year. Uh, the American oak adds a little bit more uh, complexity, gives it a little bit of uh, vanilla, smokiness, sweetness on the palate. Uh, and that's why Sandra loves this wine. Oh. Off with the, with, uh, during barbecue season, with anything off the grill. She loves a burger off the grill, a little char on the burger, and a little a plump jack merlot. It it's is, perfect. seriously y'all, my favorite pairing. This merlot with a burger off the grill, because that American oak, what it brings is, it's kind of what the grill does for the outside of a, of a burger. That smoky char, and you can just picture it, sitting on your back patio, all your friends over, grilling up some burgers, popping a bottle of Plump Jack Merlot. It's a good, good time. Yeah. Yes, it is. And just a little bit of that goes a long way. That's why we only use about 10, 11%, because if you do too much, it's too much. Like it's, when you put that burger on the grill and you got that flame jumping up and kissing it, you just want a little bit of the flame. Yeah, right? you don't right. want You don't want it, the whole thing to be on fire. You don't want a hockey puck. <laughs> you don't want a hockey puck. So. I say, American Oak's a little bit like red lipstick. Most y'all understand that, right? <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't use that. You could probably explain it to me. Y'all, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys have so many choices <laughs> of uh, how to spend your time, how to how to how to spend your dinner. Um, the fact that you chose to spend some some moments with us this Friday afternoon, uh, we're really honored. We're honored to be a part of your living room, uh, and uh, thank you for having us. These wines are for sale on the website, and what's cool is 10% of our sales, straight off the top, are gonna go to our employees who are not working at this moment because our tasting rooms are closed. So it's not a um, it's not a plead, but I just want you guys to know that we're trying to do the right thing here too. Um, but most of all, uh, as I said last week, we don't get to do this without you because Aaron can spend three years making a wine but if you don't enjoy it at home, we're done for. And I don't get to do this. And I like doing this. Me so too. Uh, thank you for supporting us. Wholeheartedly, cheers to you guys. Uh, we will cheers. we will get through this. And I look forward to, to hopefully uh, hearing some pictures, seeing some pictures from you barbecuing on your back porch soon. And I can't wait until you guys get to come visit us here at our winery. Uh, we, we miss seeing your faces out here. We so do. Thank you for tuning in. We do. We appreciate it. Cheers, y'all.